and welcome very much to our micro uh, annual lecture. It's um, a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, last year, we were unable to have an annual lecture. Uh, and so this year, we're making up for lost time. And it's a real delight that we have two international speakers who are going to help us uh, conduct a celebration um, uh, of the work uh, that's been done uh, over the last year. Uh, it is an extraordinary privilege to be the director of MICRA. We bring together um, a whole host uh, of colleagues, not just in our own university, but across the university, uh, the universities in the Northwest, um, uh, uh, across the region, across nationally and increasingly uh, internationally. And it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, the host of this. Um, we'll be recording uh, the event afterwards and it'll be available uh, on our YouTube channel from the School of Social Sciences. We can uh, provide the link uh, later. And I'm particularly grateful to welcome Emma, um, Suzanne and Kate, um, uh, who are doing the sign language uh, interpretation for us. Really important. Um, our talks are about 30 minutes long and uh, we'll have a few minutes after the end of each lecture uh, for Q&A. And uh, we'll do our best if you could uh, pop your questions in, in the chat. I'll do my best with colleagues uh, to corral them. And uh, uh, obviously any questions uh, we can arrange uh, afterwards. Um, we have a, a quick poll and uh, Suzanne, you're gonna help me by putting up uh, the poll to start with. Now, this is uh, simply for our own information in terms of um, uh, just getting an idea who the audience is. One of the things that I have learned is what gets measured gets done. And so for us to have a little bit of information, it would be grateful. So thank you very much. If you could just uh, uh, complete the poll, um, I'll see if I can complete it myself. Uh, and it would be Great, just to give us an idea uh, of the uh, audience that, that we have. Just while you're completing that, I'll introduce and not waste any time in introducing uh, our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Linda Clare. Uh, Linda is a professor of clinical psychology, specialising in ageing and dementia at the University of Exeter. Uh, I've known uh, Linda for a number of years, uh, and Linda is an icon in our field of dementia and really has done huge amounts in terms of uh, supporting the work on dementia uh, and really particularly uh, during uh, the pandemic over the last year with colleagues has done um, uh, an amazing job in, in raising the profile. So um, uh, Linda, you're going to give us a talk on that very important aspect of uh, living well with dementia. And just as we're doing that, I think we've got uh, most of the votes. So, uh, Suzanne, when you're ready, uh, we can uh, we can finish that. And there'll be one poll at the end as well. Um, but uh, we'll start proceedings now. It's on living well with dementia before, during, and after COVID nineteen. When we think about living well with a long term condition. Um, we can think about it in terms of people's perceptions of their quality of life, satisfaction with life and well-being. Living well was defined very nicely by the Institute of Medicine in 2012 as the best achievable state of health that encompasses all dimensions of physical, mental and social well-being. They went on to say that it has a unique personal meaning defined by a self-perceived level of comfort, function and contentment with life and that it's shaped by the person's physical, social and cultural surroundings and the effects not only on the individual, but also on family members, friends, and caregivers. So this definition acknowledges the need to encompass diverse aspects of well-being, to think beyond the illness, to take a positive holistic approach that considers each person's context, environment, and relationships, and acknowledges the unique aspects of each person's experience. Now, before I say any more, I want to acknowledge that I know there are differing views among people living with dementia, about the appropriateness of the term living well. 
Although I'm going to use this term, I'm aware that it may not sit right with everyone. So I ask that you think of it in the following spirit, that you think of it as representing a, a genuine aim to enable people with dementia and those supporting them to achieve the best possible level of well-being. So why should we focus on living well for people affected by dementia? Well, as we know, dementia is a global challenge um, with uh, nearly um, 10 million new cases every year, 50 million people diagnosed worldwide, and that number set to triple by 2050 um, with huge costs. And of course, we know that families and friends provide most of the care. So here in the UK, eight, over 850,000 people living with dementia. So a very sizable number. And as Dina put it, how each person thinks and feels about his or her life is important. And that is just as true for people with dementia as everyone else. Uh, but dementia does pose challenges for living well. The symptoms make things harder. They also have a wider impact. Um, they can engender anxiety or loss of confidence. Uh, the reactions of others are not always helpful. Uh, environments are not always well adapted and communities are not always inclusive. And these challenges affect how well a person can function and they result in limitations in activity and participation, uh, something that's um, described generally as a kind of disability. So are we doing enough about promoting living well for people with dementia? Well, in terms of provision of care and services, I think you'll be well aware about the, the debate currently about the social care system and the need to um, improve that. Um, in terms of research funding, uh, you know, and I've just taken an example here from Alzheimer's Society's campaign. Um, in terms of research funding, and this chart shows, um, this was based on an analysis of um, international research portfolios um, in 2016 and um, shows um, the proportion of the, this shows that this represents the whole, all of the funding de devoted to dementia research. And this little blue sliver, just over 3%, represents the proportion that is devoted to care, support and health economics. Um, so care, support and research on costs of care um, and, um, and services. So a very, very small proportion is looking at promoting living well. Um, but for those 850,000 people in the UK and 50 million people worldwide who currently have dementia, this potential of living well is really crucial. So what evidence, when, when, when my team and I started looking at this area in detail, what evidence did we have or did we find? We did a, a big systematic review, which included um, information from around 200 studies and with over 30,000 people with dementia. And we found that there are an awful lot of things that have a small association with quality of life, perhaps helping or hindering. And quality of life was the only indicator that we could analyze where there was enough evidence. Um, and although we could comment on a few individual factors that were significantly related, good relationships, social engagement, ability to carry out everyday activities, functional ability, all associated with better quality of life, and poor mental and physical health and poor care or well-being associated with poor quality of life. But there was no overall picture of how these things fit together. And then when we went on to look at what would alert us to the likelihood that someone might improve or decline over time in their ability to live well, there's very, very little evidence to go on at all. So from there, we developed the ideal programme. IDEAL is, stands for Improving the Experience of Dementia and Enhancing Active Life. It's a social science research programme on living well with dementia, now an Alzheimer's Society Centre of Excellence. And one very important aspect of IDEAL is that it in closely involves people living with dementia and carers. Um, they're um, our a group um, that contribute, known as the Always Group, and this is a photograph of some of those people who've been with us on our IDEAL journey. IDEAL... Um, was uh, had its origins in social science research funding that was um, allocated around the G8 Dementia Summit in London in 2013. 
Um, and it is a big partnership, a large program that's extended over a long period of time now. We focus on both people with dementia and their family carers. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on people with dementia. I do recognise the vital importance of carers and their experiences and the need for carers to have good support. Um, but here I'm talking about people with dementia, and that could be any type of dementia, but specifically people with in the mild to moderate stages who are still living in the community. So we're not talking about people in care homes here. So when we developed the ideal programme, we had several aims. We wanted to create this comprehensive picture of what enhances or hinders capability to live well with dementia. We wanted to understand how capability to live well changes over time. We wanted to know how we could identify people who were at risk of decline in their capability to live well. We wanted to identify what context, conditions, resources, initiatives and interventions would be needed to help really support people to live well. And, to, and we wanted to um, provide a basis for personalised planning for living well. The programme, um, the first stage, um, well, the whole programme is based around um, a large cohort study of people um, whom we follow over time, people with dementia and in many cases also their family carers. We had over 1,500 people with dementia and, 13, and nearly 1,300 carers at, um, in, at the beginning, and we've been following as many as possible. So in the first wave, we saw them on three occasions, visited at home, each occasion a year apart. Then there was a two-year gap and we were able to move to the second wave, um, ideal two, envisage to have another three uh, points of data collection. Both phases, we've had additional in-depth interviews with a small number of people. Um, and in the second phase, some linked studies with seldom heard groups. Um, and in the first phase, an arts-based project, which I'll mention later. In the second phase, we're planning a drama-based work. Um, now, we have been uh, disrupted somewhat by COVID, and so this particular time point has um, changed. We rapidly um, changed our interviewing approach to contact people by telephone or online, and we've had two um, COVID-19 projects, which I'll also talk about. And where we are now is we're just starting our final wave of data collection. To learn about living well from the ideal cohort, we have asked people at every time point about their quality of life, their well-being and their satisfaction with life. We've also asked them what living well means to you. And as I said, we've had in-depth interviews to try to understand people's experience in more depth. Um, additional to that, we've asked people about their experiences in several life domains, physical fitness and health, psychological characteristics and health, social resources, their social situation, and their ability to manage everyday life, so to deal with the symptoms of dementia and function in their daily activities. And we've looked at um, the way that the person with dementia and the carer might influence each other in terms of their own well-being. And we are looking at how these all of these things change over time and how this impacts on living well over time. So in our first um, analysis from the uh, cross-sectional data at the first time point, we looked at people's um, uh, at many uh, indicators in each of these domains. We looked to see which were associated with uh, living well, this composite of these three areas. Um, and then we retained those that were associated and um, grouped them under that one domain heading. So we ended up with our five domains, which we then um, were able to assess their relationship with living well. And further step from there, we then modelled them all together in one statistical model to see what was most important. So here the orange bars represent the first of those two steps. So these are the bars where this shows the effects where we modelled the association of each domain with ability to live well. And the orange bars show that each of those domains are important for living well. These are effect sizes, so these are strong effects um, that our data are demonstrating. Now, if you look at the blue bars, this is what happens when we put all of those domains into one statistical model. And then we find that the psychological domain dominates. So that was the only one then that's particularly significantly associated with ability to live well. So the way we've interpreted that 
is to to say that all of the domains are important for living well, but these four domains exert their effects on psychological well-being, and that in turn is associated with very closely with how people perceive their capacity to live well. Now, what we've been able to do based on those analyses is to develop um, an emerging living well map. We have one of these for carers as well, but I'm focusing, as I said, here on people with dementia. So this map shows our domains, and it also has another box, which is um, uh, reflecting the effects from the care partner, so how the care partner's well-being affects the person with dementia. And within each domain, I haven't been able to list them all because there are too many, but I've listed examples. Examples in red of things that support ability to live well, and in blue, things that hinder ability to live well. So under social resources, for example, being engaged in social activities, feeling positive about your neighbourhood, where you live, um, those things are helpful for living well and being socially isolated is unhelpful. Similarly, if we look at psychological characteristics and health, feeling positive about yourself and feeling able to cope are linked to better sense of living well and feeling lonely, feeling I'm not the same person as before and feeling depressed are linked to poorer capacity for living well. So what we can do with this living well map is a number of things. We can use this to understand the situation of everyone with dementia, or we could use it to understand the situation of particular groups of people with dementia, for example, people with a particular type of dementia, or people from a particular uh, ethnic minority group, and we could look at which of these factors are particularly important for them. Or we could use it to formulate a map for an individual or family. So we could see for any individual which of these uh, factors that I've given, uh, all of the factors in that domain, which of them are particularly relevant for that person, and crucially, where might we see the potential for change, the potential to influence things for the better. And that would allow us to come up with an action plan, um, a, if you like, a personal plan uh, for living well. Now, the other thing we were interested in knowing is how we would be able to, how living well um, how capabilities to live well might change over time and how we would um, be able to know if someone was at risk of a decline in capacity to live well. And when we look at our uh, cohort as a whole, now over the first three time points, so over a two-year period, we actually see very little change in um, the scores for living well. However, with the size of our cohort, we're able to tease that out in a bit more detail. Um, and we're, we've been able to distinguish for different groups with different trajectories. So um, here, um, this uh, chart shows the trajectories over time for our four groups. And this chart shows the breakdown in terms of the proportion of our cohort uh, in each of those groups. So I guess people often might imagine that quality of life is poor for people with dementia and gets worse over time, but that's not generally what we find. The largest group, um, represented by this pink line here, this group here, this is about, uh, this is nearly three quarters of the sample, um, and they start off with um, reasonable scores for living well, and they these scores stay stable over time. There's another group that are stable as well, this blue line here, this blue group, um, which are about uh, 12 to 13%. And they also stay stable, but they start at a much lower point. Then we have some of those people who start with reasonable scores uh, declining over time. So about 10%, to one in 10 will decline. And interestingly, also the opposite, people who start with lower scores, a small proportion will improve over time, this green line here, and that is about one in 20 who will show that pattern. So this green sector here. So this um, fits alongside our living well map um, because we can now see that um, if we work hard here at the beginning, we will be able to target our efforts in different ways. People in this pink group, we will be thinking about maintaining their ability to live well. People in the blue group will be thinking about how we improve it. 
Um, and for people in the orange group, we'll be thinking about how we prevent that decline. And for those people in the improving group, we'll be um, trying to capture the essence of, of that to, um, to inform us about how to help uh, people who are not on that trajectory in this blue group here. So we're starting to have a picture here about how to, about living well with dementia. Then along came COVID and it was clear that with this broad holistic model of living well, COVID could have a very far reaching effect. And in a way, COVID, the COVID pandemic provides a natural test of our model, our hypothesis, our expectation that these um, psychological, social factors are really important. Um, and there are lots of ways that um, the pandemic might affect the ability to live well through psychological characteristics. People might feel um, lonelier, more depressed, um, less optimistic. And social resources, they've got less opportunity to engage in activities. Um, they might feel isolated. Um, and um, of course, carers will be under increased pressure and the relationship might become strained and so on. So um, when um, COVID began, we uh, began to uh, change what we were doing. Um, our face-to-face -face interviews were stopped. So um, we replaced them first with a smaller, uh, 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 an initial uh, initiative in the first wave of the pandemic where we first, um, this was our COVID-19 dementia initiative, we first uh, wanted to develop some uh, guidance and advice to people with dementia and carers on coping with the pandemic um, at a time when many of us were, were feeling uh, confused and un uncertain. And those uh, were uh, leaflets were later translated into uh, 10 uh, languages by the Race Equality Foundation. Um, and we interviewed a number of a small number of participants from the cohort to understand their experience, and um, we were able to make some recommendations to the Department of Health and Social Care about supporting people with dementia during the pandemic. Um, we then went on to um, a new study called Include that was in the second wave of the pandemic. We've, we're just still working on the this study, um, and this was really uh, an attempt to use our ideal data. Um, to understand the, the impact of COVID by comparing pre and post COVID responses. So in Include, we interviewed 173 people with mild to moderate dementia living in the community and 288 carers. Um, and um, that included 126 dyads, couples, um, person with dementia and carer. And, and we were able to benchmark some of these responses against pre-COVID data from ideal time three. So what I would like to do now is share with you some of that data so I can show you something about the impact of COVID um, on people with dementia. So first of all, um, here are some examples of the perceived impact of the pandemic. Um, here are the blue bars of people with dementia responses and the uh, yeah, orange bars are informant responses. Now, bear in mind, these are not, these two groups are, are different. So bear that in mind. So here we can see that about half of people with dementia and, and a third of carers thought that healthcare services had been affected, healthcare had been affected. Some, a small proportion found that their healthcare had stopped, particular services had stopped. About a fifth of people with dementia said they'd avoid seeking help for health problems, a um, smaller proportion of carers thought that was the case. The next set of data look at people's perceptions of their functioning and abilities as at this point at the second wave of the pandemic and how they felt, whether they felt their abilities had worsened and declined. And so we can see if we look at the blue bars um, that between a third and a half of people with dementia felt that their abilities had declined in certain areas in memory, concentration, using language to say what you want, planning ahead, making decisions, and they were more often feeling confused. For carers, the um, proportion was more between half and three quarters, so quite strong indication there. Um, Nevertheless, there was some perception of positive benefits. Nearly a half of people with dementia and a fifth of carers saw some positives in the pandemic. 
Um, and the vast majority felt that um, taking everything into account, they had coped well, which is obviously very encouraging. Um, then if we look at the impact um, in against the benchmark, so this is perceptions of people with dementia against benchmark data. The blue bars are the responses from people with dementia and the orange bars are the benchmark data. In most cases, this was ideal time three, the last complete data collection wave before the pandemic. Um, uh, and I will say, I will mention where it is, that is not the case. So on the positive side, first of all, we found that people with dementia were slightly more satisfied with family support. They were more optimistic, slightly, expecting more good things to happen than bad. Perhaps they're thinking about getting vaccinated and uh, back to normal in this uh, second wave. And, they, and this, um, compared to the COVID, date, COVID sub-study of the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, they were less likely to feel that their financial situation had been affected. Um, then we looked at um, responses about memory. So they were more likely to say their memory was poor or very poor, more likely to have difficulty with self-care, more likely to say they feel they're not the same person as they always were, which is a really important, seems to be an important psychological indicator of poor well-being, and much more likely to say they were lonely. So from 20% in Ideal 3, uh, ideal time three, we now have 40% of people with dementia saying that they are lonely, moderately or severely lonely. Um, and then if we look at indicators of living well, um, fewer satisfied with their life, fewer feeling that what they do is worthwhile, and fewer rating their life overall as good or excellent. So next we could look at the perceptions of carers, informants against benchmark again. These are significant differences. So in some, in some positives in relation to ideal time three, um, carers were seeing less evidence of moderate or severe pain, although still a large proportion of people with pain. Um, and similarly, less um, perception that the person with dementia was depressed or anxious. But again, quite a large proportion, about a third, feeling depressed, thought to be depressed or anxious. Um, and then this one is about food insecurity is relating to um, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging COVID study. Um, there, was a, there was a slightly higher proportion who uh, thought that there was a worry about having enough food during the pandemic. Carers perceived more difficulty with self-care, more mobility problems, uh, and were less likely to rate the quality of life of the person with dementia as good or excellent than was the case in ideal time three. So we can see that this is uh, this shows a, an impact of COVID. And whereas we had challenges with living well before, we now have a bigger challenge because we have to try and think about how people can get back to that um, better, uh, better state um, as well. So what do we need to do to promote living well with dementia in the community? So I think we need to work from two directions here. Um, first of all, um, focusing on individuals and families, we need a personalised map of strength and needs to identify the actions required to maintain or improve well-being or prevent decline. We need support to develop strategies for optimising functioning and managing life with dementia. And we need targeted evidence-based interventions for specific problems. And then focusing on communities and wider society, we need a social context that includes, accepts and enables people living with dementia. Um, now, thinking about that individual level, ability to manage everyday activities um, is uh, directly related to ratings of living well. So better um, uh, ability to manage everyday activities um, is and uh, there's a there's a direct link between this is um, level of ability to manage your activities and this is scores for living well. So we can, for example, enable people to manage everyday activities. This is results from our great trial of cognitive rehabilitation and intervention designed to do that, which shows that um, cognitive rehabilitation was beneficial in supporting people to carry out the activities that they were keen to do that were meaningful to them. 
And we've been uh, training practitioners in NHS services and private care provider teams to provide this intervention. Um, and again, showing um, uh, strong uh, benefits in terms of managing those everyday activities. And we're now working, um, acknowledging not everyone will have access to a practitioner, we're working with a fantastic group of people with dementia to co-produce some self-management resources um, that can enable people um, to uh, develop some strategies for managing those um, those uh, those activities of everyday living. And these our group of people with dementia want to emphasize a message of hope, that there is hope for living with dementia. Thinking about the social context, um, I'm going to draw on the example of our arts-based work here. We, um, our artist Ian Beasley and his colleagues worked with a number of groups of people with dementia um, who uh, emphasised the themes that were important to them. And there were things like being able to get out and about, enjoy friendships and feeling included, making signs clear so you can find your way and making everyday technology easy to use, having a social care system that makes it easy to access the support you need, and bringing dementia into the open so people are aware of it. And um, our groups work to portray these themes in a series of banners, banners for hope and change. We call the project The Unfurlings. And the banners are being exhibited um, around the UK. They've just started again after COVID. They're currently at Bradford Industrial Museum and the Thackeray Medical Museum in Leeds. And they, this is people with dementia themselves advocating for the kind of change we need to see. Um, so we can, can end by saying there is hope, there is a message of hope about living more with dementia, but there is more work to do to make it a reality for more people. Thank you. Um, and I, I'd like to acknowledge everyone involved in the programme. Um, as well as our funders. Um, and if you would like more information, please have a look at our websites, um, uh, follow us on Twitter, and um, there's an email address where you can get in touch directly. Thank you. That's great, Linda. Thank you very much indeed. That's, um, uh, that's a, a really important overview and uh, uh, thank you. And thank you for your forbearance at the beginning. Uh, the um, uh, there was a black rectangle appeared a couple of times uh, just to keep me on my toes, but uh, it uh, disappeared again. And and thanks very much to Kerry and Suzanne for for doing that. So we're we're a couple of minutes over. We'll see if we can make up some time. Uh, but I don't want to shortchange people in terms of the uh, of our from of, of 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 the questions. There are a couple of very helpful um, links being put into the. Um, in, into the chat. Thanks to Catherine for the, uh, the, the direct links to some of the resources uh, and also the, um, uh, the uh, latest thing about the banners. Just, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Linda, could I just ask you, um, was there anything that surprised you? One of the things that you and I have talked about in terms of, of our national work that we do, um, is the issue of people with dementia and their families disproportionately uh, having lost out during the pandemic. And that connectedness that is so important uh, has been lost. Was there anything that surprised you about the, the results? And if you could just answer very quickly, because I'm conscious that, that, that people may well have, have, have other questions. Uh, Alistair, I, I seem to be um, not hearing you very well. I'm sorry. Can, can I first just say thank you very much for inviting me to talk on this topic to this audience? It's been great. Um, and I apologise about the technical issues. Um, Alistair, I think you said, was there anything that surprised me in the include results? Is that right? That's right. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Um, I think we expected to see some decline in quality of life scores um, and similar measures. Um, I thought we might have seen uh, a few more uh, differences than we did. Um, I was a bit surprised that there was less emphasis on health services stopping and being unavailable. Um, but it did seem from other data that people were um, at least able to contact their GPs and there were quite a lot of telephone consultations and so forth. So that may have been a mitigating factor. Right. Excellent. 
And Linda, um, there's a couple. One of, of the things that we found. Uh, Linda, I, I hope you can hear me. There, there's a couple of questions I, I'd like to give people uh, the opportunity just to ask some of uh, of the prayers. In, in your experience, what did the what did people with dementia most enjoy about taking part in the work? What was most enjoyable for them? What did people most enjoy about participating in the work? Yes. I'm not sure if you can hear me right now. Yes, um, we can hear you. Fine, Linda. So having a bit of a trouble for some reason with. Yeah, can you we, hear me? We can hear um, you fine, well, I, I hesitate really to speak for. Hello? Can you hear Hello? me? Yeah, we can hear you, Linda. Okay. Um, I hesitate to speak for people with dementia. Right? I think that the Always group have enjoyed their participation in advising on the project, and there's some information available about that on our website and in a paper they wrote. The unfurlings, uh, the groups that did the unfurlings uh, banners uh, thoroughly enjoyed producing those and were very positive about it. The study itself, people have said to us they like that it's asking about their experiences and coming from their point of view as far as possible. And I think that many of our participants appreciated that. That's some of the feedback that we've had, that it's a study about them and, and asking them. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Linda. I'm not going to push the link uh, too far, and um, someone's asked, and I wonder if Catherine might be able to uh, to help with the link. There it is. Uh, as soon as I said it, the link is there. Catherine, thank you very much uh, for the link to the great uh, website. Linda, I think we're going to we're going to quit while we're ahead there, if we may, and um, uh, move on. And we'll have a. I hope you can stay, and uh, there might be a couple of questions uh, at the end. Linda, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, for the presentation, yes, Thank you. Extremely, yeah. extremely helpful. So we're going to move on to our second speaker, and it's um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sarah Harper. Uh, Sarah is known to uh, many, many people as being uh, probably the leading gerontologist of uh, around, the, the core professor of gerontology at the University of Oxford, and the uh, uh, the founding director of the Oxford Institute for Population Aging. And Sarah, you're going to talk to us about life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. So you're going to tell us how long we're going to live. So um, I'm a gog and uh, we, we look forward to your presentation. And I think you've you've got your own slides and uh, or uh, we um, I, I hope there aren't as many glitches. <laughs> Over to you. OK, well, well, thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you to the uh, micro team for. Uh, inviting me to, to give this public lecture and, and it was wonderful um, to follow on from Linda um, and to learn about all that important work and particularly how COVID um, has impacted upon it. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Dear. I should be sharing. Am I sharing? Uh, yes. Um, you can yeah. see my screen, can you know? That works perfectly. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to talk about life expectancy, healthy life expectancy, and uh, how the trends are changing. And I'm going to reflect some of the work that I personally do, some of the work that my team at Oxford does, but also uh, some of uh, wider colleagues. Um, this is an area which is really increasing now, and, and our understanding of life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, uh, I think, is being transformed. And one of the reasons it's being transformed is because of this. Um, what do we know about life expectancy? One of the really important things we know is the role of healthy behaviours. And increasingly, uh, demographers are working not only with other uh, from the social scientists, a long time we've worked with psychologists and um, sociologists uh, and economists, but now we're beginning to work with the biologists. Um, and so to a certain extent, I'm going to try and reflect that. Um, we know aging is malleable. We know healthy behaviors can prevent chronic conditions and slow down functional decline. And, and I, I'm going to talk about two um, professors of biology that I work uh, with. And, and this is a slide from um, a colleague of mine from University of Copenhagen. I have a guest, uh, guest chair in Copenhagen. And um, Professor Lena Ramnesson has uh, very kindly um, uh, given me, me this slide, which I think really, really uh, sums up that relationship between, if you like, the way we behave, uh, and our attitudes and expectations and how that may cause stress or 
make us resilient, uh, and the actual damage it is doing at the molecular level. So we have stressors such as retirement, bereavement, and disease, uh, and they will manifest themselves typically across life course events. Um, but we also now know about how to make ourselves resilient, um, exercise, social networks, economic security, and they protect against damage. And that's the really, really important thing is that we now know that what happens to us as individuals is actually impacting uh, on the uh, molecular behavior within our bodies. Um, what else do we know? Um, we know that there are huge differences between generations. Uh, we call these cohort effects. I'll talk a little bit about, about this. And within generations, which we think of as socioeconomic effects. Um, these become much more pronounced as we age and inequality is probably one of the really important factors when we're trying to understand both life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Um, and one of the really key things that we now understand is that many of the risk factors are mutually reinforcing and they multiply over the life course. Um, and this links in very much to what uh, Linda inferred, an aging population requires integrated systems of policy funding, service delivery, and regulation. So, so that is, is the context and the background of what I want to talk about. I'm going to start um, by looking at some questions. Will inc increases in life expectancy continue? Um, how long will our children and grandchildren live for? Um, and will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? And increasingly, I think that is what we're all beginning to focus on, healthy life expectancy. Very, very difficult to measure, uh, but really that is what uh, the focus of much research and things like uh, policy, for example, are particularly interested in. So let's start with, with this first question. Will increases in both life expectancy and life extension, which is what we call longevity, uh, continue? In other words, are we going to see an increase in the average years lived by humans, but also the maximum years lived by a single uh, human being? Um, here's some very simple um, OECD figures. Uh, and what we've done here is just map some of the longest lived uh, populations. Um, and right at the top, we have Japan, France, and Spain. Um, and uh, then we drop down to UK women and USA women. And then we go to the dotted lines and the dotted lines are men. And, and this is a very well known um, a factor that there is higher mortality at all ages across the life course for men than for women. And the really interesting thing is to look at what uh, is happening, not just um, between Spanish and French women, but also that Japanese women and Korean women, as we'll see in a minute, are there. And then we have quite a drop down to UK women. Um, and I think one of the really interesting things is why do English women in particular have lower life expectancy than French women? Um, and if I talk to my French uh, demography colleagues, they point out that actually we shouldn't be looking at these things at the national level, uh, because if we compare northern French women with English women, they have very similar life expectancies. Uh, and in fact, it is the Spanish and the French and the Japanese who have the same kind of drivers in terms of things that will not be a surprise, but it is diet, exercise, our environment, uh, and uh, social interaction. So I think at one level, we really do understand how we can keep a population healthy and how we can increase life expectancy at the population level. But nowadays, because in high income countries, uh, half our populations live well over uh, uh, age 60, uh, it's far more uh, important that we understand life expectancy at age 60. And you can see the same pattern that that is continued. And in fact, if we go to life expectancy at age 80, uh, exactly the same. Those three countries in particular, Spain, Japan and France, tend to dominate and it's women who tend to dominate. I just want you to reflect uh, on the fact that there is tremendous variation year on year uh, uh, at this level. Um, and that is because when we get into the very, very old ages, um, and we obviously have uh, smaller uh, cohorts, um, you only need something like a flu epidemic um, to actually year on year quite significantly alter uh, life expectancy. Um, we know that there has been a big debate pre-COVID, uh, starting around about 2015, as to whether national life expectancies were actually um, decreasing. And I'm going to reflect a little bit on that uh, in a minute. But as you can see, generally, the trend is upwards and the same countries dominate both at birth, at age 60 and at age 80. What about uh, COVID? I'm just going to pop, I think I can get rid of this. Oops. 
so I'm trying to hide the video panel so you can see it a bit better, but that headline says COVID-19 and life expectancy. There's obviously been a huge amount um, uh, of literature which has been trying to look at the impact of COVID. And of course, a lot of it is just so early. Um, I've just put up here three papers that I think are of particular uh, interest. Um, and these have taken a slightly more sophisticated uh, view. Um, if we look at what is happening immediately, um, then we can see the following statistics. Um, we currently think uh, at the moment, um, up to uh, 11 years of life expectancy uh, could be uh, lost uh, at um, the moment around um, in North America uh, and Europe. If we look at the years at the moment, we may well see life expectancy at birth come down to below age 70. Um, this is a level not seen in high income countries since the middle of the 20th century. Um, we have very, very little data on, on what is happening in uh, middle and low, lower and middle income countries. But we also know that it isn't just going to be the immediate impact uh, of COVID-19, which is going to have probably these very temporary but quite dramatic uh, shocks. We also know that the high prevalence of COVID is having a negative impact, impact upon most healthcare systems, resulting in higher mortality rates, not only from the virus, but from other diseases and from future chronic conditions, particularly cardiovascular disease, uh, disease and cancer. And we also know that long COVID is likely to increase morbidity and chronic conditions. Um, we believe it's up to one third of those infected with the disease are going to um, end up with some kind of long COVID. And this, we believe, will also lead to lower life expectancy and lower healthy life expectancy, which is the important thing. But we also must put it in perspective. Um, and, and this is just a simple diagram with calculations from the Human Mortality Database. And you can see exactly uh, what happened um, uh, in that first B. Um, that is obviously the uh, 1918 to uh, 21 um, uh, flu epidemic. Uh, and then we have the impact um, of the war and in fact an influenza epidemic after that. But you can very clearly see the increases up constantly. So we believe there will be a rebound. Um, this may not be the case in middle and lower income countries for some time, but I think in most high income countries, we will see life expectancy rebound. And many of the arguments that we were talking about in 2019, probably within the next three to four years will be the arguments that we're using again. So if we believe that, uh, let us look at what we were saying pre-COVID. Um, let's look at um, some projections going forward. This is female life expectancy at birth in 2030. It appeared in The Lancet um, in 2017. Um, and it was a very uh, a different way of trying to calculate life expectancy uh, from ways that had happened before. It was probabilistic uh, modeling, and this is using uh, WHO material. And if we really zoom in, we can see life expectancy at birth for top 10 countries. Uh, we have France, Japan and Spain, but look what's happening in South Korea. So by 2030, this uh, data suggests that life expectancy at birth will be over 90 years. Um, and many demographers have been arguing for several decades that we would never get life expectancy at birth uh, over 90. So this uh, is uh, looking at it from the population level, suggesting that, yes, we are going to see these general increases in population. Uh, life expectancies um, and, and that they will increase quite significantly over the coming decades. A very similar amount of a very similar type um, of result came from this, um, which again was published in The Lancet. This is using very different modeling, very different data, the Human Mortality Database. Um, and what they did was they looked at the oldest age at which at least 50% of a birth cohort is still alive. And you can see um, that if we look at the brown right at the top, that's Japan. And then we drop to the red, green and gray, uh, which is uh, Italy, the US. Um, and I think, is it Italy and France? Um, and they are suggesting that the birth cohort from 2007, that half of those that were born then will make it to 104 or 107. Uh, you can see the UK comes in at about 103. So again, a very, very similar modeling picture. As a consequence, we've had real interest in centenarians. A lot of work has been done uh, on this group. Um, and just to give you a few uh, figures, this, this was something that was actually first done in Oxford by my uh, colleague, George Leeson, who 
we did this modeling. Um, we currently have about 14,000 centenarians uh, in the UK. And he projected, if you look at the green level, that we would have roughly um, half a million by the uh, turn of, uh, by the middle of the century and about um, nearly one and a half million by the end of the century. Um, and very quickly, DWP and ONS came out with a similar kind of, of projection. A huge numbers of people are likely to make it uh, to 100. We've had uh, a lot of modeling since then. Um, this is just basically showing uh, centenarians at the national level. Uh, and if you look at the first chart, that's the number of persons aged 100 or older. And you can see China by 2050 will dominate, uh, then Japan, then the US. But if we turn it around and look at the percentage of centenarians within the population, you can see the domination of both Japan and Italy. So these are countries that really are going to be aging across the first part of this century. And the really important question is, will these centenarians be healthy or will they be having uh, many of the comorbidities of later life, including, of course, what Linda was talking about, which is dementia. Um, this is uh, the latest uh, projection, uh, a latest projection, which came out of the Pew Research Center, suggesting that globally there will be um, uh, roughly um, three and um, three, six, seven, six. Uh, um, centenarians uh, globally. The really interesting question that um, many people have asked is, are these increases in life expectancy going to be continued? Um, and we all know that the longest lived person was 122. That was um, uh, a French woman, uh, Calmont. Um, we know that the longest lived man, this has been verified, was a Japanese man uh, called Kimono. He lived to 116. But are we going to see a sudden drop off uh, in uh, the early hundreds, or are we going to see real longevity come in? So will the projected increases in, in centenarians over the coming century be accompanied by increases in supercentenarians? And I think this is a fantastic uh, study by uh, a French demographer colleague called um, Rabin. And what he has done uh, is looking at the changes uh, in mortality. Um, and if you look at that dark line, that was um, the picture in France in uh, 2000 to 2004. But we compare it with the red line, which was the uh, mortality peak uh, between 1980 and 1984. And you can see a definite shift. So at the population level, yes, as we're getting more centenarians, uh, so we are also getting more super centenarians, those people who are living up to 110 and onwards. But this is a really, really uh, important um, factor. Uh, this is the um, question of inequality. So will life expectancies increase in line with life extensions? Are we all going to enjoy the benefits of longevity or is it only going to be for a few? If you remember, I said that um, in 2015, uh, both in the UK and US and EU, we saw a flattening of life expectancy. Uh, and what we now think that a lot of this is to do uh, with the fact that inequality in our society is actually reducing life expectancy. It's reducing it for women and it's flattening it for men among our lower socioeconomic groups. And that has happened to such an extent that the national levels are being affected. So one of the reasons we think why life ex uh, extension or um, life expectancy uh, is actually flattening or falling, this is pre-COVID obviously, uh, is because of inequality in our system. And I just want to very quickly highlight a study that um, I did with Kenneth Howes at the Institute um, and Stephen Baxter. Um, and this was on a, a data set of occupational pension records. We had 2.5 million um, uh, pension records. And we were able to look at inequality in mortality among this very, very specific group. We all know about things like the Whitehall study. We all know uh, about the huge difference in life expectancy across our population. But this is just taking people with occupational pensions. And I just want to show you this particular slide. Um, this is looking at differential longevity between our uh, lowest 20% and our highest 20%. And this is a comparison of life expectancies for men from age 65. And you can see that in our lowest group, the lowest 20%, uh, they were typically low income, male health retiree with an unhealthy lifestyle. And if we compare that with our highest 20% who tended to be high income, normal health retiree and a healthy lifestyle, there was 10 years difference at 65 among a very specific group who are 
uh, those who are able to have occupational pensions. We've already got rid of uh, many of those who live in areas of deprivation and are in the lower socioeconomic groups. So even within this group, there is a difference. And if we run this forward uh, and look across the probability of reaching uh, later ages, uh, we can see that um, those uh, with an unhealthy lifestyle who are in the green compared with those at a healthy lifestyle, that the difference in the probability of reaching the next age is such that it's 50% by the time we reach 85. So if we then uh, look and differentiate what are the drivers behind this, um, we were able to look at the impact of different factors on longevity. And, and, and this was quite striking. At the top, if you remember, our manual employee, poor, unhealthy lifestyle, ill health retiree, who were the majority in our bottom 20%, uh, they had about a 12 year life expectancy. Um, if this person had done a manual job, we only added on 0.4, high income 2.6, but overwhelmingly it was health and health across the life course. So retiring in normal health was another three years and a healthy lifestyle was four. So seven extra years between our bottom 20% and top 20% were around health across the life course. Uh, this really is the, the dominant uh, driver, uh, particularly in high income countries. The next question is, will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? Um, this is a, a very striking chart. I, I uh, ran the government's um, uh, foresight review on aging, and we did quite a lot of modeling uh, with the ONS. And, and this was one of the most striking tables I think we produced. And what this is doing is, is not, prepare, uh, not comparing uh, individuals, it's comparing areas. So we have uh, on the first side, the most deprived areas, and on the other side, the least deprived areas. And this is in England and Wales. And this shows um, healthy life expectancy, uh, which is um, in the green, and life expectancy, which is in the uh, sort of turquoisey blue, for men at age 65. And what basically this chart is saying is that if you live, if you're a man age 65 living in one of our most deprived areas, you probably will make it to 70. Uh, sorry, you'll probably make it to 80, but all your 70s uh, will be in ill health. You will go into ill health in your early 70s. Whereas if you live in our least deprived areas, you will make it well into your late 80s and you will not go into ill health until uh, you uh, reach uh, 80. So huge impact, again, inequality, not only on life expectancy, but also healthy life expectancy. And we can also see that at the national level. Uh, and I think the health gap is something that we are particularly uh, uh, conscious um, of. This is comparing women age 60. The, the um, straight lines are life expectancy. The dotted line is healthy life expectancy. Uh, and you can see very clearly that if we just take red, which is Japan, that tremendous health gap, even in a country like uh, Japan, uh, where we may well have um, healthy life expectancy uh, to 81, there is still a health gap of some seven or eight years when we will spend, or the Japanese uh, woman in this case, uh, will be in ill health. What about obesity? Um, until COVID came along, we were all talking about the impact of obesity. And there's been a big debate about whether growing obesity across the life course in our populations is going to increase, is going to decrease uh, life expectancy or will it decrease healthy life expectancy? Will we live as long, but we'll have more of our later years in ill health? Um, and there's been a lot of research that's come out on this. We know that higher BMI is associated with a variety of risk factors. Uh, this is a vascular disease, uh, diabetes, and even some studies have suggest reduced life expectancy. Uh, what the data pre-COVID is typically telling us, however, is that if you have very high BMIs, your life expectancy probably uh, will be uh, significantly reduced. But for those who have, uh, are overweight um, or are lower uh, obesity categories, probably it's going to be health in later life that will be reduced. In other words, through things like pharma uh, and interventions, we will be able to keep older adults who have been obese across the life course alive, but with a lot of chronic comorbidities. And I think this one, uh, many of you may have seen this slide because I have shown it on numerous occasions. I love this study. Um, this was in BMC Public Health some time ago now, but in actual fact, uh, it has been replicated uh, in many other studies, but it, but it just shows it really beautifully. Um, this is a, a, a um, Dutch sample 
where they took age 55 and what they were interested in three drivers obesity smoking and alcohol and trying to find out did it reduce life expectancy or increase disabled years and you can see very clearly from the table uh, that um, both um, smoking and alcohol reduce life expectancy in this population by three to four years and increase disabled years again about three to four three yeah three to four but obesity only reduced life expectancy by 1.4, but it increased disabled years by nearly six. So even pre-COVID, we uh, were aware of the impact of obesity on life expectancy. And of course, what we hope is that when we have longer term data, uh, we have learned so much uh, about um, mortality rates and um, particularly things like chronic comorbidities in later life uh, through the pandemic that our data going forward I think will be um, far more sophisticated and we'll be able to answer these questions uh, in a, a, a more significant way. What about life course effects? Um, as I say, health across the life course, but what about other effects? Um, and I'm not gonna go into too much time on these uh, because of time, um, but here we have uh, three um, uh, studies that um, I've recently worked on with my colleague, Sarah Zeller at Oxford. Uh, and we've been looking uh, particularly at ELSA and SHARE and looking at other life course effects other than uh, our health. Um, and in particular, we're very interested in um, uh, employment and care duties across the life course and how that impacts upon uh, subjective well-being and depression um, among women in particular in later life. Um, and so the, the first paper up there in the Journal of Vision has to share uh, and looked at um, all the countries in share. Um, we then moved on specifically to look at employment trajectories and health between English and French women. Um, and we have just finished um, doing a really interesting study looking at both Danish men and women where we've been using administrative data uh, uh, as well as data from share. And I'm just going to show you one set of slides very quickly on this. So the question we had is, does the combination of employment and care duties across the life for current cohorts uh, of uh, women in later life, um, does it impact upon subjective uh, well-being, subjective health uh, and depression? Um, and this is uh, just very quickly the self-reported health uh, for women. And it's um, here we've just mapped excellent or good, fair or poor. And we have the different types, full-time employment, care work, combining work and full-time employment, so combining care and full-time employment, care and part-time employment, and other things, uh, had a negative effect on self-reported health, whereas women who combined care and full-time employment uh, actually had a positive effect. Um, we can see exactly the same in France, um, very different, the, the, the French uh, in, in actual fact had different um, uh, data around whether they had excellent, good, fair or poor, but in fact the effects were almost identical. They did have full-time employment as having, a full, uh, as having a very positive effect, but the same picture, uh, domestic, full-time domestic care work or combining domestic work and part-time employment was negative on self-reported health. Whereas for those women who could combine care and full-time employment, there was a positive effect. Uh, and this is the depression scores very quickly, very similar. Um, if you combine domestic work and part-time employment, it is negative and it was exactly the same in France. Um, so we're now teasing some of this out because it's very, very clear that the kind of burdens and juggling that women have to do around multitasking uh, does have an impact on depression scores and self-reported self health in later life. But let's move on to this question um, because I think this is really important. Even with advances in health expectancy, will increases in the numbers of older adults increase the morbidity within the population? Um, this uh, links in with very much to what uh, Linda has been talking about. This study will be very well known to you all. It's um, that wonderful cognitive function and aging study, the CFAS study run by Carol Brain out of Cambridge, um, and some really important. Um, they were able to do a two decade comparison uh, between uh, their uh, first uh, waves and their second waves, um, and they discovered a big improvement in both 
age-specific incidence and age-specific prevalence between the two years. Uh, so in other words, the 1991 projection uh, was that um, there would be a 37% uh, increase uh, in dementia. But when they compared that with the 2011, uh, it had actually fallen by about 20% over two years. Um, and obviously, Carol, uh, Carol Brain's group did a lot of um, exploration as to why that should be. Was it pharma? Um, there's a big theory at the moment around cardiovascular disease and dementia. But one of the things they looked at also was education. Uh, and this was uh, something that came up very strongly in a similar study. This is um, public. Sorry about this. OK, sorry about that. Um, this was uh, published in JAMA um, shortly after Carol Brain's study uh, was published, um, and uh, it was based on the health and retirement study. Um, and they looked at dementia prevalence um, between uh, 2000 and 2012, uh, and they found a significant decline from 11% or 11.6% in 2000 to 88 .8 in 2012. And their argument was the education argument. It was the influence of one year schooling. This was the cohort who had just hit um, the um, change between leaving school at 14 and leaving school at 15. And it had had an impact on uh, at least the expressed symptoms of dementia. And we've known for a long time that there is an association uh, with symptoms uh, of uh, dementia uh, and uh, education. Um, and they very much based there on something called the cognitive reserve hypothesis that as the American population becomes more educated, so we should see at the national level uh, a decline in uh, both prevalence and incidence. Um, but this is, uh, I think, really significant. This was published in The Lancet. Um, and this says basically that even if we reduce the incidence of dementia in uh, population, we're still going to have quite a dramatic increase in the numbers. And if you just look in the 2040 uh, year uh, and you can see the dark block only just a little way up, and that is those people who are 70 to 74. Uh, and you can see comparing with 2010 and 2040 uh, how in actual fact uh, the number of cases uh, have declined in that age group. But look at the dramatic increase in cases, purely because our population is aging. So even if we reduce uh, the incidence uh, of dementia, the numbers of dementia probably are going to go up uh, over the next 20, 30 years. We can see that uh, looking at different factors. Uh, this is looking at uh, people who can carry out uh, one or more ADL. Um, we have cases, uh, which is A, um, and uh, you can see here, I might just lost my internet, let's go back. You can see cases um, here uh, that even if we look at B, uh, where we are looking at the prevalence, which is going up a little bit for women and more or less declining for men, that the number of cases is going to go up because of the aging of the population. And this one goes really back to what we were talking about with inequality. Um, this is uh, looking at crude incidence of heart failure, uh, and it is suggesting that we could reduce that at the national level by 18% if the whole population had the incidence of the least deprived quintile, remember we looked at that earlier on, uh, rather than it being spread uh, between the quintiles. So, so you can see at the top we have the most deprived and at the bottom we have the least. And if we can improve or reduce inequality in our population, uh, that would have a huge impact. Um, but I want to finish really um, by going back to what I said at the beginning is increasingly uh, we have realizing that we really have to take on board what is happening in biology. Up until now, um, everything that I've been talking about has basically uh, occurred due to uh, healthy living and disease prevention and cure. Um, and this is a question that my colleague Kenneth Howes raised about 10 years ago. Um, he pointed out that at the moment, uh, most of the research in this area was looking at how much life expectancy we could gain without the intensive application of scientific medicine. And that really we were just delaying the onset of age related diseases. And just to give you a an, an very simple example, um, this is uh, 
a percentage reduction in the risk of developing illness purely by increasing our fruit and vegetables. Um, and that if we go from two to 10 portions, you can see the dramatic reduction that we would see in heart disease, stroke in particular, 33 down to 18, um, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and even premature death. So this is really what we've been working on. Healthy life, exercise, our diet, reducing obesity, et cetera. But what happens in this world, regenerative medicine and age retardation? How much life expectancy will we gain with the intensive application of scientific medicine? Um, and this is where I am very grateful, not only to Lena, who's the professor of bio, uh, to uh, my colleague, Lynn Cox, who is professor of biology here um, in Oxford. Um, let's look at one of these, and this comes from Lynn's uh, work. And um, on my screen, you can't see the title because, and I don't know how to get rid of that bar thing. So it actually says cell senescence and whole body aging. Um, and, and this is a slide that I've taken from Lynn because I think it, it is a, a very interesting uh, slide. Uh, which shows what we really are beginning to understand about senescence. So we're going to look at cell senescence. Um, and what is very clear is that our premature aging, that there is a correlation um, uh, with senescence. Uh, senescent cell numbers uh, increase with chronological age. There's a correlation. Senescent cells are necessary to cause aging, um, and therefore if we could remove senescent cells, we would be able to uh, rejuvenate ourselves and increase our lifespan. And senescent cells are sufficient to cause aging, and uh, there has been, as you know, a variety uh, of experimental work over the last five to ten years, and, and this is uh, just an example of injecting senescent cells into young mice and causing premature aging. So that whole area of senescence research uh, is really making an impact uh, on our understanding uh, of how we might be actually able to uh, reduce aging within the body uh, and also uh, to actually rejuvenate uh, the human uh, body. The mind is something else and, and, and uh, that's a very interesting uh, discussion point. So we now have a huge number of commercial um, and actually government funded uh, work uh, around what is called senotherapy. Um, and this is the development of possible therapeutic agents to target cellular senescence. Um, and we understand that there are what is called senolytic molecules in the body um, and they may um, induce, uh, sorry, molecules which selectively induce the death of senescent cells in the body. Um, and there are senomorphic, which alter senescent cell at the phototypical uh, level. And because we have this knowledge, uh, a lot of these companies are now introducing uh, this, a anti-aging supplements. Um, and I know, going back to Linda, as talk, of course, you will all be aware of the uh, recent um, this week, in fact, uh, announcement um, of these uh, uh, the drugs that um, are being looked at both in, uh, I think have just been accepted in the US and, and we're now looking at them, which in theory, if they're given in early Alzheimer's, uh, can reduce uh, the progression uh, of the disease. Um, this is exactly what is happening in the body. And these uh, drugs are freely available um, now on the internet. And there is this massive um, push Although to a certain extent, this whole anti-aging area is a commercial um, uh, effect, um, without any doubt, there is some very, very serious science and understanding behind that, which is really raising all sorts of questions about how long at the population level are we going uh, to be able to live? And what kind of questions are going to be uh, raised? Um, and I want to um, show you this slide. Uh, which is my last scientific slide. And this is um, some work that we were interested in doing with uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Paul Fairchild, um, and he works uh, on stem cell rejuvenation. And, and I'm sure you are aware that uh, in the laboratory uh, through stem cells, we are now able to rejuvenate all sorts uh, of parts of the body. Um, and the real revolution was to move from embryonic stem cells, which have had all sorts of problems with rejection and in fact, ethics, uh, to stem cells uh, where we're taking individual cells uh, from the body and being able to turn them into stem cells. 
So in other words, you can take a human, you can take a skin cell, you can reprogram that, you can turn it into a stem cell and then make it a therapeutic stem cell. And in theory, we could uh, start regrowing parts of our body. But one of the things that we were interested in doing was, can we project forward demographically how this will alter life expectancy and what would be the societal impacts? And then Paul points out something which I think is a really important factor. He knows that at the level that he's working, that if you introduce stem cells into the body, of course, what you potentially are encouraging is that other, other type of growth cell, which are cancer cells, because to a certain extent, that's what cancer is about. It is cells that are reproducing, being rejuvenated and reproducing. And as he points out, what we don't know at the population level is if this kind of therapy becomes widespread and suddenly we can start rejuvenating the body, not only will we have people living longer, but we potentially will have a significant number of the population living longer with cancer. Now, maybe that's something as a society we're happy with. I mean, maybe, you know, we accept that we will be trying to uh, encourage people to take these therapies and live longer and people will want to take them, but we will increase cancer within the population. So the problem I think we're facing as a society is that science is there. It is driving this forward, both in this kind of stem cell therapy and in the rejuvenation field, but it has all sorts, uh, obviously, of implications um, not only for society, but also uh, for um, the, the standard of health within our population, the kind of lives that we're going to be living. Um, and I'm going to um, finish there. Um, can I just show two more slides, Alistair? Of course, and yeah, I was just, uh, yeah, yeah. See why in a minute. So in a way, my talk has stopped, and, but I just wanted to show you two slides. And that is a picture of some young women. They've just arrived in Cambridge and uh, they're all 18 and they're all sitting there or for their matriculation photo, very, very excited about their lives. And the reason I want to show you that is because of this. This is me. And that is Linda Clark. And there we were together, um, I won't say how many decades ago, um, and I don't think either of us ever thought that so many years later we would have appearing together giving a lecture on aging. So it has been a delight uh, to talk today and it's been an absolute delight to reunite with Linda in doing that. So thank you very much. Sarah, thank you very much in, indeed. That's the, uh, <clears throat> that's the best end to a lecture I've heard in a long time and the lecture itself was, uh, was fantastic. And, could I just say that neither you or Linda have changed at all uh, uh, over the years, so it'll be fantastic to hear uh, what, what, what your secret is. We've got um, uh, Linda, it's great to see that you're still there and uh, we might be able to catch up on a couple of questions. I'm conscious we've got about five minutes because one of the few jobs the chairman has to do is to keep people to time. Um, but uh, we've got a, a few minutes. There were a couple of questions uh, that came in, Sarah, particularly. One was to do with the, um, it was to do with uh, the uh, one assessment of health being subjective and how you, um, it was the, the health in the, 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 the HX is subjective. And how do you, how do you target that, um, uh, that subjective nature? We know some countries are happier than others. How do you yes. do that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important question. Now, obviously, we were using shared data. So, so this is collected uh, data. Um, uh, Axel Borsch Japan, uh, who I don't think still runs share, but very much set it up um, in the early 2000s. I think share is running, I, th I think Elsa is over 20 years now and share is just about in 20 years. Um, and uh, I, I think one of the really interesting things is how do you analyze cross-culturally subjective data? Um, and I will refer you, and I can't immediately, but um, I will refer you to a paper that Axel borsch Japan did, um, probably after about five years, um, where he actually looked at subjective views on, he on health. And, and the point the questionnaire makes um, uh, is exactly right, that consistently the uh, Germans had a far greater negative view of subjective well-being and health than the British did. Um, and I'm not an expert in this area at all, but he introduced some really interesting uh, 
a sort of statistical weighting to try and cope with this, particularly when you have got, I can't remember, is it 12 or even 14 countries in share? Right. So, so I refer you to his work. But yes, right. um, it, 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 it obviously is an issue. Um, and that's right. why it was so interesting that we had very similar results, given that actually the French and the um, uh, English women's baseline was very different. Great. And, uh, and you mentioned the, uh, the Food and Drug Administration's approval of uh, 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 aducanumab um, a couple of days ago. And uh, as you yeah. say, we, we, we await with interest. It's a bit more expensive than some of the, uh, uh, of the supplements you mentioned, but very important. Uh, Julia Horn asked, can you comment on the impact of the state pension age increases? You, there were that very interesting yes. slide about the association of, uh, of, of education. Yes, and I mean that that is a really interesting um, uh, factor, and it will be very interesting to see how COVID has impacted upon this. Um, I mean, I think one of the things is that we argued very strongly about 20 years ago when the government first green paper came out on this, um, that linking it with pure longevity wasn't necessarily the right way, that we needed to look at healthy life expectancy within the population. Otherwise, we risk having huge numbers of um, older adults basically going on to disability benefits uh, and then staggering on disability benefits until they reach um, a state uh, pension age. And we also clearly are going to have an issue going forward about the ability of older adults to remain in the labour market. Uh, I, I mean, given the contraction that most economies are going to see, and I think when we look at the impact of the pandemic, we need to look at it also from the impact of an economic recession. And are we all those gains we've made over the last 20 years of allowing older adults to stay in the labour market if they wished, are they not going to be taken away uh, as a result of COVID um, right. and younger people begin, being given priority? Right. So it's a really interesting area. Uh, someone's asked the, the name of the research you just mentioned about comparing Germany and the UK. Uh, Axel, Axel Borsch Supan. Axel Borsch Supan. Super. Fantastic. Yes. Um, what is it, Sarah, that that fascinates people? Why, why did Captain Sir Tom Moore really fascinate yes. uh, uh, people? What is it about aging? And I remember speaking to colleagues who uh, uh, were involved in um, uh, in in um, in uh, uh, interviewing um, Jean Calmon, the, the the oldest person. And apparently, the the apocryphal story is that. Uh, that people were going around looking for centenarians and she wasn't included in the first wave and actually, um, uh, you know, volunteered and said, what, what, why am I not included? What is it about centenarians like Jean and Sir Tom that really excite yes. people, do you think? I'm, 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 I mean, I think there's various things. I mean, one, we have not had mass centenarians. Um, you know, I mean, even when I was a child, it was, you know, three score years and ten. I mean, people who made it into their 70s. Um, so there has been this dramatic increase in older adults. I mean, I, as I say, I started in, in anthropology and I worked in social history, in fact, with Pat Payne for quite a while. And I think actually there is something about at the end of one's life connecting us with our past and our history. I think there's something about generational succession. Um, and, and also, of course, you know, I mean, we, have, we are losing a very special cohort that did you know go through the war and and i think and i think that was also part of it but a lot of these people are are just amazingly gutsy people and we do know that people particularly who make it between 105 uh, onwards um they may be slightly genetically different but they tend to have characteristics of optimism and you know verve and um so right. so yes excellent and, and we, we certainly know in, in, in my field in old age psychiatry, people who have particular personality traits tend to live longer. So it's very important. Thanks very much to Catherine uh, for putting some of the uh, of the links, uh, including the spelling of, of your colleague's name um, uh, in the uh, in, in the chat. And, and everyone has been uh, absolutely fantastic. It's uh, in closing now. It's been a real tour de force. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you, Sarah. It's been uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, it was the, uh, I think the team did it on purpose to keep me on my toes earlier on with a couple of glitches. Uh, but again, it shows that technology always works without a glitch. And if there's any trouble, you just switch it off and on again. And uh, it, uh, it works perfectly. And perhaps, Sarah, in terms of our genes in future, uh, if there was a lesson, if we could switch things off and on again, uh, that, that might help. Could I just thank everyone who's been involved? 
Suzanne Kerry and all the team who's been involved in putting this this together. Thank you to the audience for attending. Um, it's it's been uh, really great. Thank you again to Linda and Sarah for such uh, superb presentations. Um, thankfully. Um, I think it was probably the poll that blocked out the screen so uh, uh, earlier on. So uh, if we put it back on, if you could um, uh, do that again, this is information just for us, if you could complete the poll. And uh, if I could end by thanking everyone very much again, and hopefully this time next year, we'll be able to meet in person. So thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy uh, the rest of the week. Thank you very much. <laughs>